Hey, man. Hey, John. Yo. I don't know what's going on with my desktop is acting up right now, but it's not letting me sign into Skype, even though I can sign in just fine on my phone. So something's going haywire there. So I guess we'll just, uh, you know, I'm going to try to download it or whatever, but um, if you want, I guess I'll just have to do it on my phone. Okay, no problem. Yeah, so uh, I kind of wanted to talk about a couple things, mainly, um, you know, I guess how traditionalism is going to, is kind of working its way into uh, MGTOW and, you know, how feminism would uh, will rebrand itself. I just uploaded a video uh, on that topic, so... Um, would you be interested in talking like that or yeah, talking totally. about that subject? Um, okay, sure. I actually, I am, I will say skeptical that um, traditionalism is entering MGTOW. I would say it's probably more accurate to characterize that, that the sort of mainstream of the men's rights movement, I know that's in, you know, sure. sort of a contradiction in terms, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, sure, um, sure. Is adopting um, traditionalism out of almost out of despair, right? Yeah. Um, well, this... do you want to now? Let me ask you real quick. Do you want to? Do you want to record this and talk about it? Because you know, I feel like when we, you know, when you're first starting to discuss it, it's fresh, and then if you're just kind of reiterating things, yeah, you know, it's it's kind of. Uh, but that's the thing, you know, because my Skype act, my Skype is acting up. I don't know if uh, well, if I can do it on my end. Well, you know, I, so I that's okay. I've got an app that, that automatically records my calls. I usually just delete them right away, but if you want, I'll give you the recording of this afterwards, and then, oh, you'll, sure. okay. and then you'll have a high-quality uh, copy. Perfect, perfect. Um, so, no, I think that like the, the men's rights movement ca cause has been kind of hammering away for like pre decades, really, yeah. um, with very little uh, effective change happening. I mean, some of these issues are starting to creep into the mainstream dialogue, but I mean, the progress is really, really slow. Sure. And for a lot of guys in the movement who've been doing it for 10 years or more, there's a kind of despair, like, because there's not really any doubt about the, the, you know, the suicide rate or the workplace death rate or the homelessness rate or, you know, the fact that most mental illness it, mental illness is dominated by men, um, and well, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, you have to kind of take into account that this goes back. Oh, geez, Warren Farrell's been doing this for what twenty years, probably yeah. more. So, and uh, you know, people are starting to see men are still killing themselves. We saw what happened with Earl Silverman, well, uh, and nothing's 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 changing. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, but the and, thing you know, people can make the argument that perhaps it takes something on the order of 40, 50 years to start changing legislation. Certainly feminism took perhaps that long, but I don't know if society is ready, uh, at least with feminism, society was kind of ready to accept women as uh, equal politically speaking, but I don't think they're, they're ready to accept men as equal politically speaking, because we all know that means a whole lot of things that men and women both are uncomfortable with. Well, feminism succeeded as fast as it did because technology and society changed to allow for more leisure time, more um, you know, more disposable food, sure, sa safety in the streets, the fact that there's trucks going across the country with refrigerated food in them, and having women be an idle leisure class is a byproduct of modern technology. If you go back 300 years you had sort of a more traditional family model which was necessary for communities to survive and women in that role were like well you've got to take care of the kids because we don't have you know state-sponsored daycare and we don't have you know government schools and stuff so the women did like lower technology farming was done using prim more primitive um, uh, forestry was done using more primitive technology mining was done using more primitive technology which meant that you didn't have a lot of the leisure time and disposable income that you have now. Um, and as you go forward in technology, you create a leisure cast out of your, your the surplus of your community. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, it's, uh, it's, it's, it changes the expression of, of human nature. I, I've talked about this before. But yeah, absolutely. You, as mechanization you know, uh, progresses, especially with women, and this is continuing, you know, this isn't stopping with the washing machine and the dishwasher, 
uh, it's, it's only going to continue to get uh, worse in terms of that. But So what is your opinion then on, do you think feminism uh, was more of a, a result of only technology? Was it maybe, of course it had something to do with government. Uh, do you lean towards uh, any other, you know, any technology or government or a hybrid of both? Well, I think it's uh, a hybrid of both. The, sure. The, the social situation created by, you know, modern machine technology, automation and stuff, allowed for there to be a leisure caste, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so you had half the, half the population not contributing to taxable income. Home, work that was done in the home was not taxable. It's like a woman taking care of her kids or doing the laundry or whatever. Like, that's still work, but it's not work with a salary attached other than the indirect salary of the husband who goes out and works in a factory or as a salesman or something like that. Um, so from the point of view of government, that half of the working population taking care of kids, doing laundry, doing house, like, it's work, but it's not, you know, salaried work. They sure. can't tax that. So they've got all this exchange of value happening inside of human society, but the government can't really get their hands on it. By pushing women into the workforce, which they did say, we want to give you the, quote, right to go to work, we're going to free you from your domestic slavitude or something. Um, now women are out in the workforce, meaning everything they do is taxed. And all the work that gets done at home, you taking care of kids, vacuuming and, you know, all that stuff, the domestic stuff that used to be um, the traditionalist woman's role, that now has to be done by outsiders. You have to hire someone to take care of your kids. You put your kid in a daycare or they're in school all the time. Um, so work that used to be done still has to be done. They cut in half the value of labor to the individual by doubling the available workforce. If, you, if half the society is at home not getting paid a salary, then the workforce, the labor force in your society is literally half. It's, if it's only men working, then the value of labor is increased because your labor pool shrinks. When you add women in, the labor pool effectively doubles relative to the population, therefore the value of labor goes down and the power of the individual goes down. All of this is in aid of central government. Now, you can argue about whether this is, you know, uh, by sinister design or simply a byproduct. It actually doesn't matter because the result is the same. Sure. Well, I've, I've said, even if it is something, you know, sinister design, hidden hand, or whatever you want to call it, uh, they had to take advantage of these natural drives. It just couldn't occur without it. Um, you know, this is something that even if we could prove, for example, that uh, a bunch of cultural Marxists or communists uh, planned or plotted to set this thing up in order to uh, expand the tax base and thereby expand government control and uh, centralized government, uh, how would they have done it without these uh, biological realities at play? Yeah. Right? They had to have known that women were, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, a little bit arrogant and a little bit vain in terms of when they're giving an, uh, an opportunity to say, essentially to men, yeah, 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 you know, I, I can work, I don't need you anymore. Right, they knew that this would play to uh, women's kind of uh, base core arrogance, if you want to call it that. Well, I would, and, uh, you know, I, it's not generalizing women. Men are arrogant too, just in different ways. I would but, say that the 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 arrogance, the sort of the the princess mentality, is not innate to women. It's just that because of the biological reality, because men in the traditional role were in the workforce and women are at home, um, women were essentially a cared for social caste. And being cared for gives you this gives you child mind, right? In some yeah. degree, I mean, it's not like they're actually. I, I, would, I would argue. Uh, my, my opinion is is sure. There's uh, there's certain there's certain realities that were at play that it's kind of a a, a mixture of socialization and biology. Whereas this, it's kind of reinforcing itself. It's like a feedback loop. Of course, women tend to. You know, of course, I'm not saying that this is all women, but they tend to have uh, this this childlike mentality at least more so than men. And, you know, I don't even know if that's accurate because men are pretty naive about certain things, especially when it comes to relationships with women. But uh, women are naive, too, in terms of uh, sometimes being more likely uh, to view themselves uh, view, view themselves as looking inward and uh, kind of seeing the world as, as, it, as though it's revolving around them. Yeah. Um, but but uh, 
that creates a little bit of a feedback loop where we're, where we're just reinforcing uh, this tendency. And, you know, it's a problem that, uh, frankly, I don't really know if I see a, a, an exit to or a solution to. Well, I do. And you know? it comes in two different um, areas. Sure. One is uh, MGTOW. The, and I actually am grateful to feminism for becoming as toxic and yeah. completely malevolent. I mean, it's it's nakedly destructive now. It's it's you're not even sort of the blue pill general public really believes feminism is positive anymore. But people well, are we still see, we see this whole fiasco that happened. I guess they're calling it shirt gate or shirt storm, where uh, this whole uh, you know uh, situation that happened with uh, the uh, the astrophysicist that landed this spacecraft on a comet, right? This, yeah. this person should be regarded as a hero uh, by essentially the whole world. Yeah. And so we have feminists who have gained a reputation for doing their slut walks and this and that, telling telling a man of this uh, importance that he's not allowed to wear a shirt because it offends them. And so people are seeing this and it's, it's starting to backfire against them. And I think this this is why we're going to start to see a, 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 I guess, subtle rejection of feminism by women, perhaps, uh, even women against feminism, uh, and they're going to start to see, well, it's not returning the same dividends. We're not getting the same benefits we used to from it. All the privileges that we're going to extract from supporting feminism are already encoded into law. And so, you know, where do we go from here? This is where I worry the rebranding of feminism is going to come uh, come into uh, play, and uh, perhaps that's going to break off into, I just talked about this in a video I uploaded, uh, a factioning or a fract you know a fractionalization of women uh, that either either tend towards this traditionalist route or towards a reinvention of feminism. Uh, those are the only options that I see at play here as more men start to uh, uh, reject the, the traditional protector provider role. Well, uh, the thing is that women, the vast majority of women, have always rejected feminism. Feminism is has always been a minority position. It's just that women have this social power of when they scream about something, Ten men will come running to do something about it. Yeah. Um, that, but that is feminism, in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. But the thing is, it's not just that women are rejecting feminism. Remember the power of the power of a woman's voice to compel male obedience. Not even like you must do whatever X Y Z. Just I'm unhappy about whatever, and then you know every guy in hearing will come running to try to fix whatever that problem is, even if it's not actually a problem. But what's happening now is feminism has become so completely over-the-top toxic in the most naked and obvious ways that men are rejecting not just feminism, but women, which is sure, breaking... Sure. It, feminism has, has gone so far that it's now breaking the social bonds between men and women, where women are now quite correctly, and, and to, only to a small degree so far, but I think it's going to go farther... Men are now seeing women as a threat. Like, yeah. if you're in the room with me as a woman, you're a threat unless I know that you're, you know, reliable and you're not crazy and all that stuff. Yeah. And well, I think, I think, you know, to say, here's what I disagree with you. To say that the vast majority of women um, have have rejected feminism traditionally. Uh, well, I think a distinction has to be made. Just like there's the vast majority of men. Generally, you know, one of the things that drives MGTOW, uh, I think MGTOW is a bit of a sleeping giant in that when the conditions are such that men have no incentive to perform for women or it becomes just outright dangerous, as modern feminism has made it. So um, then you start to see uh, organic situations where men in mass start to adopt unconsciously without talking to each other, without discussing it with each other, uh, MGTOW-esque uh, behavior. Oh, yeah. Women... Women, absolutely, you know, for the most part, the vast majority of women don't outright associate or call themselves a feminist. It's kind of this faraway thing. And uh, I guess when pressed against the wall, you know, when, when really pressed to describe whether or not they're a feminist, most women would, you know, after they give the kind of um, default line, the dictionary definition of feminism, oh, feminism is equality, it stands for equality between the genders. Of course, most women are going to say yes. But they know, and we know, that it's not that. It's not limited to that. That It's something far more sinister. But they're okay with it. They kind of just well, let it go. And they understand that they, they benefit from it somehow. I don't know if the vast majority of women grasp feminism on, on you know, a real intellectual in-depth scale. 
but they know that they they gain some sort of benefit from it. And I think men, I don't think they understand feminism. You know, the average blue pill guy walking on the street, I don't think he understands just how toxic feminism really is. He's starting to perhaps uh, see it. He's starting to sense it. And, uh, you know, you're, we're seeing just the beginnings of men starting to reject this. But I, I don't know if I don't know if the vast majority of them understand why it's so toxic. Well, the the conservative women's movement, which is not new. I mean, like, you've got the Penny Nance, Concerned Women of America, which is actually a political organization. And then there's, the, you know, the Republican Wives, you know, societies and all that stuff. They have always been against feminism because, not being completely stupid idiots, they see that the toxicity and the the vitriol drives men away from their normal traditionalist social role of protect and provide for women. That is, the traditional model is still a heavily gynocentric model. Sure, the, the, you have gendered roles where the guy goes in, into the workforce and he actually is the guy whose name is on the paycheck, but he's basically the money and protection provider for a woman in that traditional model. So traditionalist women have always been against feminism because it yeah. it forces them into the workforce. It forces them to basically yeah. be yeah. responsible but for themselves. Like, let's say let's say that we were to take any one of these groups or just traditionalist women if we were to do some kind of demographic survey on traditionalist women and we were to tell them uh, because men have the responsibility to take care of you because they're burdened with providing and protecting for you we're going to take away your right to vote. We're going to take away your right to uh, have a job if you want one. Uh, I think a lot of women would be up in arms about that, even the traditionalist women. Oh, and they, absolutely. You know, yeah. they, they very quickly find their feminist uh, associations then. So, it, you know, what we're dealing with here isn't, I guess, true traditionalism separate from feminism. It's kind of blending. It's kind of a spectrum of uh, two, two forces of gynocentrism kind of competing for male labor and male protection and provision. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I really see them as uh, too distinct. Well, um, that's just the way I visualize it. The, they, they use different approaches, right? Yeah. Like the feminist approach, which is, you know, I, I have to give a little bit of admission to Bernard Chapin here. Feminism is a creature of the left. Sure. And it uses the government as the intermediary between men and women. So yeah. women in the feminist model are still looking for men to, you know, pay for their stuff, basically. Of course, but instead yeah. of, it all boils down to who's going to fund women. Who's yeah, gonna fund, but, yeah, but instead of having a one-to-one -one relationship between men and women in that model, it is women relating to men through the government. So the government basically taxes the workforce most of which is male. That's why you. That's why the gender wage gap is so important. Um, and then, if you look at where the money is spent, it's about eighty percent on women. And uh, I'm not yeah. pulling that number out of the air. That's actually been documented. Yeah, yeah. Um, but on on the traditionalist side, instead of the government being an intermediary, you have a much more um, direct relationship between men and women, where you have gendered roles, where the men are the protectors and providers, and the women are the domestic, you know, people who make babies and take care of the household and all that stuff. But in each of these cases, it's still men providing for women. It's just in one of them, it's through the intermediary of the government, and the government takes a cut and you know fucks up everybody's life. Um, sure. But I see that the, the, the rise of traditionalism within the men's movement is, I think, born out of two things. One is kind of a despair at the fact that we've pushed all these issues into the public sphere, the suicide rate, homelessness, and so on, and ev everybody knows about all that now. They just don't give a fuck. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, you have this, this movement going, well, hey, m men die earlier and they, you know, die in the workplace and so on. Uh, well, I guess if nobody cares, maybe we can go back to a traditionalist model because at least then, although men were still women's servants financially, at least men had some sort of esteem in their lives rather than being constantly told they were, you know, rape zombies or something. Sure, sure. But now, see, this is where, this is where I start to think, you know, when we say at least men had this, I guess, uh, privilege... Or, or honored uh, status in society, we have to ask ourselves which men, right? There were there was still homelessness. Uh, there was still 
uh, male suicide at a higher, much higher rate than women. Oh, certainly uh, there I was. Guess, yeah, there, there the, was. The but... only men that were honored were, were the ones, of course, who could demonstrate or successfully demonstrate their utility. Uh, you know, I guess it's it's not much different because there's still homelessness and suicide uh, with feminism as well. But uh, you know, there there was a you know, it's not like men as a whole are respected simply for being men, whereas of course women, uh, by virtue of their bi biology, were. Uh, well, the thing is that, that I'm, I'm going to slightly disagree, but it's almost a disagreement over definitions here. Men were respected for being men, but being a man was an achievement rather than simply your identity because you have sure. male, a male yeah, body, right? So, um, you know, yes, in both cases you have homelessness and workplace death and all this other business, but it's not even about whether you've got a vast number of men living on the street or dying, it's about whether you have a human esteem in the society that you're in. In the present feminist model, you, you're basically lacking human esteem as a man. Being a man is basically a negative um, label. Whereas in the traditionalist model, although you're still uh, you know, a protector provider, you're, in the, you know, you're yoked to the cart, you're basically the horse, um, at least there you have like well you know you get a shiny uniform or something yeah but it's it's ar it's arguable i think whether or not this is a, a voluntary interaction i don't want to sound like a feminist here and say that there's some giant uh, conspiracy in order to uh, uh, socialize men into uh, falling into this protective provider role but it does have an effect it does have an effect as we see with the uh, white feather campaign uh, shame was a, was a valuable component in getting men into line and getting them to exploit themselves to the point where we had 16-year-old uh, men being shamed by these women, um, it, it, you know, forcing them essentially to go to war. And I'm sure some of these 16-year-old, I don't even want to know if I want to call them men, they were boys at that point, uh, died on the battle lines, on the front lines. So we have to ask ourselves, how important is it for men to be viewed uh, in the eyes of women as not being a coward, not being, you know, uh, uh, devoid of utility. This is something that is essentially a male weak spot, and the exploitation of it has been going on for a very long time. And I think unless men, uh, this is why I don't advocate for a return to, to traditionalism, because it's just going to focus on that pendulum of shaming men back into line, and we know we have a weakness for it. We know this is kryptonite to the, the male identity. Well, We're very scared of you know shame, being shamed by women. I think that's uh, largely due to socialization. And as much as we see this return, well, I'm not sure I call it a return to traditionalism, at least a desire to return to traditionalism because of that, you know, even though you're still a slave, you have esteem. It won't work because traditionalism worked due to a lower technology and the economics of the time. We don't have the economics of subsistence economy farming communities anymore. We're living in a highly mechanized, automated technological age. So you might want to go back to a so-called traditionalist model, but the economics of what made it work in the first place no longer exist. So I'm not all that worried. Yeah, I think, well, I, of course. I mean, even if, yeah, let's say we all agree tomorrow you, the entire manosphere just decided, okay, you know, wrap it up. Traditionalism is the only way to go. How would we, how would we even get back there? It's well, impossible. We, you can't because the economy of it, the, the way that the workforce works, the technology that we live with doesn't support that model anymore. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's still, there's still a mass of men, a, a, a resource, a repository of men propping up women. It's just uh, much less so. Uh, than the times we lived in, you know, uh, agrarian society. So, you know, there's still, there's still, of course, uh, we're just being taxed through government and men are propping up uh, women and feminism that way, uh, kind of without giving consent. But, but it's only going to, it's only going to increasingly become this way because technology is, of course, continuously developing and it's not going to stop. The march of technology is not going to stop it. It's only going to move towards uh, decreasing the amount of physical labor needed, the amount of physical exertion needed to have a functioning society. Yeah. And uh, so, of course, you know, this is only going to get worse yeah. uh, in terms of our ability to go back to traditionalism. It's only going to be um, uh, inhibited even further. Well, there are three things in our favor here. One is that our present economy is a debt-based economy. 
Yeah. And that is unsustainable. Yeah. You cannot just kick the can of debt down the street forever and continuously increase the debt. Because in theory you could because you're just playing with numbers. But the the byproduct of that is that you you pass that debt on to the next generation, onto your children or, you know, you, your younger siblings or, you know, I'm in my 40s. So a guy in his 20s is born into a much greater debt than I was born into and it was bad enough when I was in my 20s. Yeah. So that sure. that has to collapse. Now, I don't know yeah, if it's going to collapse. Mean, well, something's got to give. Something's yeah. got to give. It can't continue this. So way. this welfare state where you have this, this diminishing workforce, this increasing debt load, and this increasing uh, increasing the scope of government where women basically are married, instead of marrying men, they're marrying the government, that is unsustainable. It has to fall down at some point. And I don't know if it's going to happen right away or but, farther yeah, down the road. That's the question. That's the how long, how much longer can it last? And I think... Well, there's, there's you know, two may, other factors I'm, here. You know, maybe I'm just being pessimistic, but well, I think it could last another 50 years, another 60 years before, you know, we start to see signs of collapse. It's very likely, I don't know, you know, of course, I'm not an economist and I don't know, I think you know, I'm not an expert on these, th on these things, but America, uh, you know, Western civilization, I could see it lasting for a, a few more centuries yeah. without you know, it, really collapsing. It might, but I think it's going to go a lot faster, and there's two factors which contribute to this. One is the growth of MGTOW. Now, the overt MGTOW community, that is the people who directly call themselves men going their own way, who write about it or do videos or whatever, that's the tiniest tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of what you and I call MGTOW are men who have never heard of us, who have never heard of men going their own way, they've never seen the, the little sign with the arrow going off to the side. They have no idea about this, quote, movement. They're just evaluating the life that they're living and going, fuck this, I'm not going to go get a job because I'm just going to be a wage slave yeah. and people are going to steal all my stuff. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, it's it's organic. The, yeah. These men are not, they have no idea what MGTOW is and they've never heard of it. But it's At happening best, naturally. what we're doing here online is kind of uh, for uh, I guess I guess kind of making content for when people actually uh, start to understand what MGTOW is, if if they if they see it and start to define it on the mass scale, they'll look and say, oh, okay, something was going on 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Look at what happened. They called it. I guess you know that's really all we can do. We're televising uh, yeah. the revolution. That's all we're doing. Sure, sure. But men, you know, this is an this is an organic thing. That's why this is uh, MGTOW or the phenomenon. You know the the. The unconscious MGTOW, if you want to call it that, yeah. the average blue pill guy who is seeing his wages decrease and, uh, you know, seeing women become more and more narcissistic and entitled to the point where it's almost dangerous to even interact with them, uh, he's going to make that decision all on its own. And yeah. that's going to happen on the macro scale if it continues down this path. But the consequence uh, of that, the consequence of that is men opting out of being part of the workforce or being part of that um, career ladder that funds that whole apparatus of government. So this, the financial collapse that we've, you know, kind of smelling in the wind, that's going to happen faster and faster. The more toxic the system gets, the more men opt out, the faster the system collapses. Sure. The fact that we are generating content and creating ideas and looking for solutions and sort of digging into our, uh, our, our human motivations, what we are doing is providing, hopefully, a roadmap for a new way of doing things that is not exploitive, that is not destructive to humans. And when the system gets to a tipping point where it's like, well, we must, we absolutely require a new way of doing it, hopefully we will have you, me, Stardust, all these other guys, lots more that I, whose names I don't know, will have provided some, you know, some thoughts, some ideas that can be picked up and run with and expanded on. Yeah, yeah. I've used, I've used the example uh, a lot of, you know, the, the Mars satellite. You know, how do you, how do you get a Mars lander or, you know, Mars rover from uh, planet Earth to the red planet? Well, of course, you spend years and years and years writing billions of lines of code and, you know, assembling this machine that you know is not going to fail and you know is going to be able to receive uh, uh, power from the sun, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, when you blast that rocket off into space, it has to rely on Newtonian laws of physics to get to that, you know, to get from point A to point B. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess not having to deal with friction in space or very little friction if there's any. Uh, it's going to get there. Uh, you didn't power it. You didn't power it the whole way through. 
and that's what feminism was, I think, and I think that's what MGTOW is. Um, it's not. It's something that kind of external conditions, even if there was some kind of conspiracy to set this these kind of social situations into motion, uh, it kind of has to rely on uh, you know the nature the nature of the environment that we're traversing through. Yeah. Well, here's the third pu- here's the third piece of the puzzle that makes me optimistic. You know that that women it, socially women are conferred a human value just by existing where men have to attain their value socially right mm-hmm. well the the byproduct of that in a highly male toxic culture in a culture that and it and we are in a male toxic culture it's getting more toxic and you know when i see laws like the yes means yes law and other pieces of legislated insanity I'm, I'm could, happy. You, uh, could you uh, educate me? I'm, I haven't heard of that law. Okay. In California, uh, they just passed a law that campus, on, oh, on university oh, campuses... Yeah, I, I didn't hear you correctly. You, you mean the yes means yes law? Yeah, that, that's what I said. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I didn't hear you correctly. And, but there's other pieces of legislated insanity. Um, in New Jersey, they're talking about a law. I don't know if it's actually gone to the House floor yet, but they're talking about a law where anybody who misrepresents their economic status... Um, in in leading up to a sexual encounter can be charged with rape afterwards because if you present yourself as a successful you know moneyed up guy in order to bang some chick and it turns yeah, out yeah. you you just which work. has been happening since you know the the advent of currency <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know I mean it's ridiculous but see what these laws are designed to do John is they, they, of course, this isn't going to be enforced every time someone has sex. There's not going to be some government task force uh, filling out a survey. You know, did you consent? Did you consent? No, no, no. But minutes, it, uh, you know, five minutes into the sexual activity, this is designed so when they want to target a specific male, they're going to be able to. Oh yeah, you know? but it, but it, what it does is it increases the culture of toxicity, and as much as these are bad for men at an individualistic level, in terms of creating the culture that's going to break this cycle of. Uh, you know, left versus right, the traditional model versus the feminist model, they're both highly gynocentric. The more toxic the feminist model becomes, the more impetus MGTOW has to realize itself and create something entirely new. Sure. And in this environment, because men uh, must achieve, they must contribute, they must do something to have social value, um, that actually drives the social innovation of MGTOW. It's going to drive the creation of new social norms that are non-toxic, that are non-destructive to human beings. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, something that's not really talked about too much is, of course, we can talk about how we're kind of being forced into this position, but I think, I think John, that when men start to understand uh, the freedom that MGTOW offers them, right, that they don't have to be defined by some protector provider role, uh, the, the social conditioning wears away pretty fast. I think the biggest step is getting men to understand this and, and to make it something not to be ashamed of. You understand? Because when men start to finally conceptualize that, yeah, I don't have to devote a vast majority of my, of my time and my wealth towards uh, a woman, uh, I think they, they, they really gravitate towards that message pretty fast. It's just dealing with the years and years of conditioning uh, that you know tell them that this is how a man should be. Uh, of course, there's biology, and of course we have uh, a biological tendency to do these things. But I think when men finally get it and finally see that message, I think they're pretty receptive to it. Well, it's you know everybody has to unprogram themselves, yeah. and I suspect that for younger guys it's easier because yeah. they're they're born into you know they're entering into a society that is more toxic than the one that you know guys who are ten or fifteen years or twenty years older than them uh, entered into. When I was in my 20s, I had no idea that this was a male toxic culture. Um, it's, it's stunningly clear to me now um, because I've been kind of studying it. But breaking out of that um, group conferral of identity where you can stop taking your identity from the approval of the group, which is basically the approval of women, and, and decide, well, fuck you, I'm going to define myself. That I have value because I say so. There is still an element of social um, approval there because we are social animals you know yeah, you can't course. completely break well, we have this these these kind of contradictory drives where uh, of course everybody wants to belong everybody wants to be liked but uh, I think that men more so than women uh, are are kind of conducive towards freedom 
men generally, you know, we went out and explored, we went out and conquered, and so we have that ingrained desire to, to uh, you know, seek adventure, and that translates a lot of times towards social isolation, and I think we deal with that a lot better than women. I, we can be alone and be entertained. Well, uh, we can be on our own and isolated and be entertained. As you know, m myself, uh, I, I like spending time with my friends and all of that. But I need sometimes two or three days without dealing with anybody. Yeah, because uh, it's just you know it just feels better, and I have time to pursue my own interests. I think that's a uniquely male thing. Of course, it shows up in women, but. Uh, well, we I think that. I think what you're talking about is introversion versus version. Uh, uh, sorry, introversion ver versus extroversion. But the 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 desire to go out and conquer, or to go out and explore, or to create something new. I am convinced, and and I may be wrong here, but I am convinced that because that is a risk taking behavior, and it is. You know, you 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 risk being you know uh, laughed at. You risk. Oh, that people will say, well, what you're trying to do is impossible. I started a software company, and I was developing software, and this is like uh, almost 20 years ago. I was developing software that at the time, the existing software community looked at what I was doing and said, that's impossible. You can't do that. And to me, it was like, challenge accepted. Yeah, yeah. But that is at least partly driven by the so my own social conditioning, which is the male social conditioning that you must contribute you must do something to achieve a positive identity i think i think the key is to harness that that social conditioning for the benefit of the individual man taking part in it that's what makes the benefit of men barbara man that is what MGTOW is sure that is yeah, what it is in, in my mind that's the core of it that is yeah. why you know the the people who are aware of the movement not the unconscious MGTOW, but the guys who self-identify that is why there is a drive for excellence because sure. we are getting, at least in part, our, and it's a basic human need, our basic human need for recognition met through our own excellence within the community. We're not looking to be told, well, you're a good man because you're taking care of a woman, or you're a good man because no, you're... It's, it's it's a matter of taking pride in your ability to uh, convey your arguments in, in a way that not only helps men, but in a way that you consider yourself, you know, to have accomplished something. Yeah. Right. And I think that's a strong inst instinct in men, and I think it should be cultivated. But it should be cultivated, you know, as I just said, for for the benefit of the man doing it. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, I agree. And as much as this is going to play into that old stupid gynocentric drive that almost everybody else shares, when we do this, when we achieve this, in not as individuals, but as as the and I call it a phenomenon rather than a movement because most of the people in it have no idea about it. Um, when the MGTOW phenomenon manifests changes in society, it's not just good for men, it's good for everybody. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is th this same drive that you're talking about is, is, what took us, is what took us to the moon and what's going to take us to the stars if we ever get there. Yeah. Of course, of course, everybody benefits from it. And this is, you know, I've talked about this uh, numerous times, if we continue down this path, treating women like children, because think about it, John, think about the amount of, I think MGTOW, as much as we're accused of being uh, misogynist and sexist against women, uh, think about the, the amount of potential that we're squandering by treating women this way. Oh, yeah. Right? This is, this is uh, something that could benefit our species, treating women as, as adults and expecting them to behave like adults and expecting them to, uh, you know, maybe even innovate and invent and could contribute something other than reproduction to the human species. Um, you know, if we if we demand this of women, or say, okay, you don't want to act like an adult, we're just going to do our own thing. Uh, the whole the whole planet, the whole species, will benefit from this. Oh yeah, you know. And, and I, just, I don't think we actually have to demand anything of women as saying, well, you must you know meet some criteria. We just need to say, I I don't want anything to do with you until you act like a grown up. And I don't oh, yeah, think... yeah, that's that's what I mean by demand. Yeah. Of, of course, you know, not forcing women to act any certain way, but uh, just saying because uh, a lot of men have never been told this, but women want uh, the attention of men. Uh, the women want to be accepted by men, just like men want to be accepted by women. It just takes different forms. Yeah. Right. And and so if you if you say if a woman sees if women in general see that men are doing their own thing for their own reasons, for example, let's say women rejected that tomorrow. 
um, you know, and, and want nothing to do with it. Whoa. And said, I, I, we don't care if men go off and do their own thing. And so long as men are still doing it for their own reason, everyone's going to benefit. Whoa. But a residual effect of that is that women are perhaps going to see this and say, okay, we're not getting the same amount of attention. We're not getting the same amount of, uh, you know, male, uh, you know, uh, affections or whatever, whatever you want to call well, it. Well, it's happening already. Look at women yeah. against feminism. That is purely a bid for male attention. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I go, <laughs> I've called them before, you know, high fashion selfies. It's like, uh, okay. So we have men that have dedicated years of their life towards uh, putting forth the best videos, the best content, the best articles, whatever you want to call it, the best thought that, that you can, uh, that, that we could muster, right? And this is something that's not easy. It's something that takes a lot of thought and a lot of innovation. And then you have a, af after all the work is done, you have a group of women that are taking high fashion selfies, uh, writing how they hate feminism now, and it's, you know, it's, it's expected to be this glorious, uh, you know, miraculous thing. It doesn't impress me, you know? Well, I mean, look at, uh, you know, YouTubers like, Crystal Garcia or Shield Wife, they have <laughs> massive amounts of subscribers and views, and yeah. they are saying nothing of interest. Well, this is this is I think the problem with the men's movement is that we can have a woman tomorrow, uh, and, and of course this excludes people like Girl Rights, but she earned uh, you know where she's at now. Uh, but the, the the dynamic at play in the men's rights movement is that you can have a woman uh, kind of put out some generic, uh, hollow, empty speech about anti-feminism, repeat things that have been invented, I don't know, five years ago by MGTOW or, you know, MRAs or what have you, and she can garner the same amount of subscribers in a week that has taken men five, six years to get. Oh, yeah. And that's that's the problem, you know. I mean, and, and so this, this dynamic at play, and this is kind of the motivation, I think, behind uh, the tendency for uh, men's rights activists to sometimes put women at the forefront uh, they understand that people are more receptive towards what women have to say, whether it's right or wrong. But that same dynamic that causes that that increased uh, desire to listen to what a woman has to say uh, is the problem. Oh, <laughs> you gee. know, it's kind of like we're 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 address we're attacking the movement by attacking ourselves. Yeah, I uh, I'm guilty of that myself. I recruited lots of the females who are now at a voice for men um, because I knew that with them saying the words more people would be listening. Sure, um, yeah. But, but see, that, that's the thing. And, you know, I'm not faulting you or anything like that. This is, this is how men behave. You know, we're, we all have, uh, you know, uh, we, we all have a desire. We're born ingrained with a desire to be served out of women. I'm not even saying that's what you're, what you're doing, but I'm saying the dynamic at play that, that uh, perpetuates that uh, is it, essentially by, by pursuing that strategy, we're shooting ourselves in the own foot because we're only reinforcing the dynamic that has caused feminism in the first place. Yeah. Now, I, know, it's, it's like a catch-22. I My my failing was that um, I brought the, like, you know, um, well, I'm, I'm partly guilty for Wooly Bumblebee. Now, I didn't <laughs> give her, yeah. I didn't give her the, the position at EVFM, but I'm the one who kind of brought her in, and then Paul said, oh, another woman, Yahoo, give her a fucking high, high status <laughs> position, right? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, Paul, aren't you moving a little fast? And of course, she almost immediately had a meltdown, right? Um, but I also brought in uh, Karen Strawn. Uh, she, now, she, I didn't you know, create her as a YouTube entity or anything like that. She had her own presence. She had a big audience already. But I brought her onto the ABFM radio show. Um, and Typhoon Blue and uh, what's her name? Nerdy Dancing and a whole bunch of others. The problem, my failing was that I expected the other guys in the men's rights movement part of the, you know, the part of the movement that I was a part of back then to be self-aware enough not to fall over their own dicks in elevating <laughs> these women above, you know, their own merit, right? So you sure. suddenly you got a masthead on a, on the men the biggest men's rights site in the world full of women and the guys who have actually been doing all the heavy lifting are <laughs> getting pushed to the bottom of the list yeah. because yeah. If you have a well, uterus or a pair okay. of tits, you know. Sure. So let me ask you this then, because my my policy on this whole, uh, you know, whether or not women should be included, and of course I'm not an MRA. I don't pretend to be an MRA, and I don't even care that MRAs uh, include women in, in in their activities. But I think that the the desire for men to be servile to women or to fall over their own dicks, as you just put it, uh, is so strong that at times. 
even even somebody such as myself wouldn't even know that they were you know engaging in that behavior. So I just say, okay, no women allowed in my channel. Or you know, if you're going to watch, you can comment. But there there will never be a time where you have any kind of per permission to uh, to influence this channel or to tell men that they should you know police their tone or what have you. Uh, because uh, I think that's the only way that uh, I know of that to, to completely negate the ability for women to kind of... I mean, you know what they do. Yeah. Uh, they, they, we all see this with the Gamergate fiasco going on. We saw this in the atheism community. How do you even stop it? I mean, a lot of men don't even know when they're being manipulated. Yeah, they don't. They think that they're, you know, being the correct manly man by, you know, elevating a woman. They haven't analyzed yeah. their own social I think, conditioning. I think there's another... Uh, there's another thing at play too, because most men they don't they, they're gen. It's it's really evil, you know, not women doing this, but it's really evil. Some of the emotions, the male emotions that are being played upon here and manipulated. Because I think another aspect to this is that a lot of men or most men don't want to be viewed as sexism and generally aren't sexist uh, against women and generally don't hate uh, women and they don't want to be perceived as being uh, a hater of women or a misogynist. And, of course, that's taken advantage of and that's exploited uh, to, to uh, kind of, um, you know, put forth a whole range of, of sexism against men. And, of uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's really pretty devious when you, when you look at the... Uh, oh, yeah. Well, you know. the thing is, part of the... You're, you're addressing the need for an overt, self-aware, and, and, and loudly broadcasting segment of the MGTOW phenomenon, which is, you know, guys like you and me to say, well, here's some stuff that I'm aware of in human psychology, in my male psychology, that we need to crush it out. Um, I, I'll give you an example of, of my own male motivation. I, uh, I commute to work by bike because I live in a, you know, a large city and there's really no need for me to have a car and it's a lot cheaper on a bike and actually faster. Sure. Um, and, and I ride through this neighborhood um, pretty frequently because it's on my way to work where there's it's like a downtown um, residential neighborhood it's like businesses and condos all piled up on top of each other so there's always people on the streets day or night in this particular neighborhood and you know you see people out you know hand in hand having a on a date or coming back from a bar or whatever and on a recent occasion I saw a, a young man and a young woman um, having some kind of an argument and riding past and it's a you know a twenty whatever twenty two year old um, oriental woman and a young guy about her age, and there's some kind of conflict. I don't know what they're saying because I'm you know half a block away, and I pull over and stopped by instinct, thinking, yeah. oh yeah, thinking yeah, it's extremely powerful. You don't even realize sometimes, yeah, that but, you're white knighting. Before, yeah, you're already doing it by the time you realize exactly. You're doing it. So I put the brakes on and I pulled my bike over and I'm not like going to go up there and get in anybody's face. I'm just going to stand back and like my instinct is just make sure everything is kosher, right? Yeah. And as soon as I stopped, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, John? Exactly. Right? Yeah. And so then I realized, you know what? That chick might say something nasty or vile or, you know, uh, false or fraudulent about him. She might oh, throw absolutely. him under the bus. Absolutely. So, and, and you have to also... You have to also take into account that a lot of these women, I've seen this happen multiple times, where some guy, being a white knight, steps into some dispute between a man and a woman, and ends up getting his ass kicked or stabbed or even killed. You know? Yeah. Um, so you have, you have your own safety to be concerned about. But the, the question that I always ask myself uh, when confronting these situations is, would I stop for a man? And if the answer is no, then I just leave. I just leave her be. You know, and she she has to she has to get out of that situation on her own. Yeah. So it's time that we start allowing women to face the consequences of their actions. Well, I'll tell you, I actually went farther than what I've said so far. Once I, you know, I stopped, and then I realized I'm like, oh, what are you doing, John? But I didn't just pedal away. I stayed there, but I changed my focus to from my instinctive, which was to protect that the woman, and I said, no, I'm going to stay here and make sure that guy is okay. And so yeah. I did. I stayed in and watched because it was like, you know, you never know. Some other white knight might step in and drive that guy with a big punch to the head or something. Absolutely. So, yeah, um, no, a, a big part of this, you know, pulling this through or uh, I guess achieving male sovereignty or at least promoting it is is sometimes going 100% counter to your own instincts. Yeah. Uh, it's it's self-mastery. And self-mastery sometimes involves uh, doing the exact opposite of what you would normally do. Yeah. So, and... and this incident turned out to be nothing. They both 
you know, walked away with no incident. But for me, it was a bit of a watershed moment where I, I stopped and then I arrested my own behavior, used my, my, you know, engaged in rational thought. I went, wait a minute, he's much more at threat than she is because some white knight will, you know, come up and pummel him or she'll accuse him of something and he goes to jail or whatever. So, you know, my behavior then I modified to protect that guy. It turned out he didn't need my protection, but that is now my model for behavior. Yeah, but increasingly, more and more, guys do need protection. They don't even realize it most of the time. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, these days, I, I sometimes I get nervous just getting in the same elevator with a woman I don't know. Because who knows what she's going to say. And, you know, look, it's, 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 it's unfortunate that we have to think that way, but really we've been left with not much of a choice. Well, you know, I, I was reading something, uh, I think on uh, Reddit slash MGTOW, where a guy was saying, no, no, it was an article um, from Kenya. There's apparently a sex strike in Kenya where men are refusing to have sex with women. Oh, that must have been furious. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the reporter was, like, admitted in the opening of the, uh, in the article that this whole thing made her very uncomfortable because sex is her weapon, not a man's uh, weapon. Uh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's kind of like the, the Greek Lysistrata, but, uh, you know, I, I've, I've found um, women get very angry when you deprive them of sex. I mean, they, they do not like it. Well, because uh, it... And, yeah, because they, they believe that that's their domain and they should be able to call the shots. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's maybe because I'm getting older, um, you know, I'm still, I'm not exactly a spring chicken anymore, but I don't really want to have sex as much as uh, I I, know, I, I used to when I was 18, probably just a decrease in testosterone, whatever it is. But, you know, it, it's just like you should see some of the attitudes that uh, women have uh, displayed when you tell them, no, I don't want to have sex. You know, I'm just well, going to do my is, own thing. My, I'm, I'm probably as sexually active now in my life as I've ever been. Um, and the thing is, my what motivates my sexual appetite has changed radically from the simple you know, cute butt or, you know, long blonde hair or whatever is the, the visual signifier of, um, you know, physical health and sexual yeah. maturity and all that stuff, that that is, it still gets my attention. You know, some jiggly piece of uh, woman yeah. flesh walks by, it's still going to cause my eyeball to swivel, but I no longer want to do anything other than look until I know that person is you know, a reliable human being, a person I can have some sort of a, uh, an intellectual human connection with. That is where my sexual desire is now. It's no longer just, you know, cute butt or big tits. Yeah, yeah. yeah I hear you. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, I just, you know, I just, I'm, like I said, I, I can't motivate myself anymore to pursue it. Yeah. Um, it's something that has to come to be and, and be made easy for the most part. And um, and you yeah. got and you've intellectualized your your sexual desire to some degree too. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I can't. You know, I, I just can't. Vapid airheads, no matter how uh, attractive they are physically, I just I can't be around them anymore. Well, they're good looking until they open their mouth and speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that about sums it up. Yeah. Anyway, dude, um, I got to get on with my day here. Um, sure. What I'll do is I'll uh, save this recording and send you the copy. 